I'm going to show you in this video how to make a plaster mold like this out of one of these in which you can create multiple clay cast shapes like this. Okay, to make a mold of this plastic ball should be relatively simple because it is a, a plain sphere and it will be a simple two part mold. One piece, two piece, plaster mold. If we were making a, a mold of a mug, for example, that could be a one, two piece simple mold. Uh, but with this one, it's actually a three part mold because it has a, an indented foot underneath. So you've got one piece of mold that comes off this way and then one, two. This is, this is the actual mold of that mug, just so you can see what I'm talking about. I take it apart. These are the two sides and that's the foot. Three part mould. Don't need to worry about that with our ball because it's a simple two part mould. First thing we need to do is to work out where those two parts of the mould are going to be. On this ball I will hold it in front of me and then I will draw a line all the way around to the point where I could almost not see the tip of the pen and that would mark the visible area that would make up one part of the half of the mould. Now I can cheat with this ball because conveniently there is a seam line all the way around the ball so I don't even have to do that. With an item like this mug, if you were making a mould of a mug, I would do the same thing. I would hold it in front of me and I would draw a line with a marker pen all the way around what I feel is the halfway point, just to the point where I can't see the tip of the pen, all the way around. And when I get to this point here, if I was to draw a line in there, well I can't see the tip of the pen, so it has to go around the rim and then we go down and then that half and the same on that side I'd have to go around the rim there and back around the handle and that will be exactly where those two parts of the mould would end and that circle that is the third part of the mould that's coming up in that direction and as you saw in the mould it is a three part mould. That is actually quite nice on a mug because it gives you a a foot you can wipe the glaze off and stand it on the kiln shelf during the glaze firing which is quite a nice uh, addition but you don't need to you if you're doing a first mold uh, and you choose to do a mug maybe just stick with a two-part mold to start with or do a spear like I'm doing today so what we need to do now is the line that I've just drawn or the seam line on this I need to pack clay all the way up to that point and that will mark out the halfway point of my mould and I will do that now. So the clay that I'm using it doesn't really matter um, it doesn't matter what clay you use it's only been used as a barrier to, to pour the plaster up to. This is actually earthenware clay it's smooth earthenware clay and I can get a nice flat surface with it it doesn't really matter what clay you use and this is clay that I've I've used before for the same purpose and it's got bits of rubbish and plaster and dirt in it it doesn't matter I'm not going to be actually finishing a piece with this clay or firing it so it's it's absolutely fine I just keep it in a bag with a bit of water and it is my my mold making clay but you can use whatever you have to hand So I just want to make sure, as much as I can do, that the line, the seam line, or the equator on this ball is as level as, as it can be. I don't want to be making a mould at an angle. I want that line to be um, almost horizontal in line with the surface of the, the table.
Next thing I'm going to do is just take it a, a blunt knife, a butter knife. I'm just going to flatten the surface here and get that nice and smooth all the way around where the seam line needs to be. Doing that I can see that I'm way off on some of my seam lines. So I'm just going to build that back up again. Right, I think that's pretty much done. Just a little note on this point of the process. From experience, it pays to spend a bit of time getting this as perfect as you can because, trust me, it's easier to um, flatten the surface of clay than it is to adjust the surface of a set piece of plaster. So try and get this as, as good as you can before we go to the next stage of casting plaster onto it. But before we get to that point, I need to get this into a square shape because I'm going to block this into a, a square border of my, my boards here. We're going to make a box around it. So I need to make this into a square so I've got to fill in the corners of this clay. Now I've squared it up, uh, we need to think about how thick we want the mould outside the piece. What's, what size border do we want around the item? Obviously you don't want a really thin plaster wall because the water from the slip when you're casting it needs to go somewhere. So you want a decent reservoir of plaster. But you don't want it so big that it makes the plaster mould really heavy and cumbersome. So what I generally go for, be it right or wrong, is to my knuckle. So I want a minimum of to my knuckle. I mean we can make it more accurate when we've done the first half of the mould. But I know that that's about an inch. So if I just go a little bit more than I think is an inch on each side and just chop that to make it square. Yeah, so that's more or less a square at least an inch longer than my knuckle on all four sides. Now we need to block it in to get ready to pour the plaster on. So I use these, these are boards that I've had for years and years and years. There's a piece of uh, chipboard covered in uh, a plastic surface which is perfect for having the, the plaster separate and not stick to the, to the surface of the wood. And on the edge I have these metal, they were actually roofing bars that I've just screwed to the to the ends of the board. And if we have uh, four of them, and I've got uh, clamps that go on the corners. Move this out of the way. Got the four boards up, and we've made pretty much a square there and what these boards will allow me to do is to get an idea of whether we are nice and square just by just by using my eye I can see that my cuts with the clay weren't that wonderful it doesn't matter because we can as I said we can sort that out when we cast the plaster but it gives me a, a guide as to whether I need to move the walls in order to make it more of a right angled box. Well, I think that's good enough. So I'll tighten the clamps up. Okay, however, if we were to pour this with plaster now, 
obviously the plaster would go straight down the gaps all around the edges and underneath and then onto the floor so we need to get some more clay and this is where it's handy if you've made your margin a bit bigger than you need to because we are going to make some clay sausages and line the outside of the mould so the plaster doesn't escape. And then we need more little sausages just to be extra cautious up the corners to make sure the plaster doesn't escape through some of the gaps between the boards. And trust me, you can't overdo this. A number of times I've thought, oh, it, that'll be all right. Never is. Only when you've taken dry plaster out of your shoelaces do you realise that actually this is worth doing and spending a little bit of time just making sure there is no way for the plaster to escape. Right, I think that's good to go. I'll just move the camera so you can see. So all around the edges you can see I've got clay along the bottom and up the sides and that plaster should stay inside that box and not get on the floor. So that's the plan. Okay we're almost ready to mix the plaster and make our first half for the mould. Now if, I know I've banged on about this, but if, if you think that there might be a chance that um, if you're making a bigger mould, if there's a lot of plaster inside these four walls, then it would pay, just for the heck of it, we got the clay here, just to go around and just put clay all along the edges of the boards on the outside, just to reinforce it and make it a little bit stronger on all sides. It would only take a few minutes to do and it might save you a lot of, uh, a lot of bother. This is quite small, so play with last words. This is going to be fine. It's going to be fine. Um, so I think we are now ready to work out how much plaster we need to mix up. So it's handy to work out how much plaster you might need to fill up the mould before you start mixing. Uh, you don't want to have too much plaster, obviously, because that's wasteful. But also you don't want to not have enough because if you don't have enough then by the time you've mixed up another batch the first bit that you put in there is probably set and that's not ideal. So what I'm going to try and do put a plastic bag carefully into the space here and then fill that with water so I said before I want about an inch of plaster between the edge of the um, the edge of the mould and the actual piece. The same when it comes to the top of the plaster. I want an inch, which is about a knuckle, between the surface of the water and my piece, which that's almost an inch. And the bag isn't quite big enough, so it's bulging in a little bit. So it's not going to give me a precise amount, but it's. It's going to be a good. Um, it's going to be a good start. It's going to be something to go on. So if we go and weigh this, that is exactly three and a half liters of water. That weighed three point five kilos, which is three and a half liters of water. So now we know the the volume of the the mold is three and a half liters. If I halve that which is one and three quarters, and conveniently 1.75 kilograms as well. If we pour that into a bag,
and then we take the weight of the water and we multiply that by what works for me is 1.6 so if we multiply 1.75 by 1.6 we get 2.8 so if we take that back to zero and we add 2.8 kilos of plaster Two point nine, a little bit too much. Well, that should be all right. Right, this is the fun bit. So, what's quite clever is having it in a bag. You can mix the pasta up without having to have drills or sticks in buckets. You can do this with your hands. So if you give the plaster a few minutes to just thicken a little bit, you don't want it freshly mixed, you just want to let it start to get a bit thick and just keep the bag moving to try and bring the bubbles to the surface. Um, because we are pouring plaster onto clay, which is um, obviously not porous and plastic or vinyl which is again not porous and the sides of this uh, plasticized wood which is again non-porous we don't need to put any separator any mold separator on because the plaster is not going to stick to any of that you can make molds of porous material but you do need to put a barrier or a mold soap on and we'll be doing that on the second part of the mould to stop the plaster sticking to the plaster. But on this side we don't need to. But what I will do to prevent any air bubbles on the surface of the dry uh, vinyl ball is I will just get some water and just spray a little mist of water just on the surface. And what that will do when you pour the plaster in the plaster will then chase the, the, the water beads on the surface of the, uh, of the surface in the vinyl and will prevent any water, um, sorry, any air pockets collecting in the mould. So when you're pouring with the, the, the plaster, it, it doesn't really matter on this because it's just a ball, but if you've got a very delicate surface with lots of detail, I wouldn't pour directly onto that. You'd pour down in an area where there isn't any detail. Don't pour it in too fast because then you're going to get your band to fold in some air pockets. Nice even pace and just check that there's no leaks, no plaster disappearing out through the, the gaps in the, the walls that you've missed. And then you hope that you've got enough plaster and it's going to cover and it does. Magic. So with that little trick you should find that you've got more or less the right amount of plaster for your mould. If we just squeeze the last bit out And then I know it wastes a bag, but that's it. This goes in the bin and there's no buckets that I have to clean out. So we'll just give that a bit of a knock. And we could just move that about. Again, there's no clay sculpture in there, so I know I'm not going to damage it. Just give it a little wobble, try and encourage those air bubbles that might be in there just to come to the surface. And then we leave that to set. The plaster will harden relatively quickly and you'll feel as it, um, as it thickens, it becomes hard and then it becomes warm and over a large surface area it might actually become 
quite warm uh, and on a cold day you can see steam coming off the top. Once that heat has gone then that plaster is set and it'll be ready to demold. So I'll undo the clamps and see what we got. So what I always try and do is keep my boards clean and try and make that the first thing I do when I'm demolding. Otherwise I just end up with mess everywhere. Okay, if we take the clay off, we should find that we have more or less half a mould ready made. So we've got a bit of plaster, a little bit of plaster has seeped uh, between the clay and the ball. So I need to just wipe that off and clean the ball up before we make the, the second part of the mould. But that's, that's looking pretty good to me. In fact, what I'm going to do, because it's a ball and it's easy to, to take out and it has no undercuts, I think it might pay me just to remove it. Ta-da! And then I can clean up that edge and I can get rid of all the residue plaster off that. And then when I'm ready to make the second part of the mould, I can just pop that straight back in again. I'm just going to tidy this up a bit. What I do need to do um, is to make some keys. And to make a key you can use a drill or a router or what I'm going to use is a spoon. A little tip when you're doing keys on a mould like this, I'm doing three because that way I know when I have the two halves of the mould I'm going to know which way around to put the mould together. If I did four I'm going to be offering it up and finding it doesn't quite fit and then offering it up again and so on. Three holes, three lugs, it's always going to go back the same way. Okay next I'm going to use a piece of wet and dry sandpaper. This is 600 grade so it's very fine and just sanding just inside these little holes I've made just to get them nice and smooth and also open them up a little bit I don't want them too um, I don't want any sharp edges on the on these lugs I think that is uh, good to go. We just need to get rid of some of this clay and plaster that's on the ball. I just had to rotate the ball because as much as that appears round, spherical, it's not. It's slightly uh, indented on one side. So if it didn't go back in the same way, I was going to get plaster going down on my side of the ball here, uh, which still might happen. Um, but that looks like that's the best fit. Um, so I should have just noted how it came out and put it back in exactly the same way. But I think that's good. I think that's fine. Now we're ready to make the other half of the mould. But I need to consider that if I pour plaster onto plaster it's going to stick. So we need to put a barrier between this part of the mould and the plaster we're going to pour on. We don't need to put anything on this because uh, as I said earlier this is non-porous so this won't and it hasn't stuck to plaster. But this area I'm going to need to apply some mould soap. So this is the stuff that I use which I've tried various soaps over the years and they all worked in varying degrees but this one 
I like the most but you might find one that works better for you. The general principle is the same, it's just putting a barrier between the two plasters. I apply one coat, let that absorb and then come back and I'll apply another one. So while I'm waiting for that first coat of mould separator to absorb, uh, we need to think about how we're going to get the slip into the casting mould. Now we do that by means of a pore hole, a casting hole, and that will be in the half of the mould that I haven't made yet. So rather than cast the plaster as a, as a block and then think about how I'm going to make the hole, I should think about the hole before I make the, the block. Um, what I use for something like this is a pipe. It saves a lot of time trying to get a perfectly round hole by cutting it and carving it with knives. This pipe, which is uh, that big, uh, this is, um, is that a two inch, it's almost perfect. Ideally, uh, a pore hole is quite handy to have as a, a tilted hole on, on many moulds. Uh, and I could always adapt this after I've cast the plaster. I could carve the hole to open up the edges a little bit. Um, but I'm going to use this as my, as my hole in the plaster. Uh, if I just put it and stuck it onto the ball like that, there's a chance that the plaster will find its way into the tube and um, weld this bit of pipe into the plaster block. So what I need to do is, there's two things I could do. I could either hold this on the ball and then fill this with thick plaster. So then when I pour plaster on the outside, the, the, the plaster's not going to be able to go inside because it's full of already set plaster. The problem with doing that is then I'm going to get plaster stuck in my tube. So what I am going to do is I'm going to fill this with clay because that's easy for me to remove and use this, this tube again. Just made that a little bit concave just so it fits on top of on top of that. If I get a little bit of plaster going underneath it, it doesn't matter because that's easy for me to then clean up, but it's going to save me the bother of making a, a big hole in a, in a piece of set plaster. All right, that's all absorbed, so time for a second coat. Just make sure all that mould separator is dry if you pour plaster onto wet mould separator, you end up with a scab on the surface of the plaster. Well, that looks and feels good. So, I'll start boarding it up again. If you wanted a perfectly square mould, it would pay you to now uh, cut this, the, this half of the mould so it's perfectly square and then block it all in um, rather than making the two parts of the mould and then trying to make it perfect, making the whole thing perfectly square. But I don't need to worry about that. It's, I don't want to over, I don't want to overdo it with this. I'm just making a mould of a ball. This is fine for my requirements. So the clamps are on, they're nice and tight. Uh, what I need to do before I pour, obviously, is make a few little snakes of clay to plug any gaps that the plaster might find. I'm just going to spray a bit of water onto that the clay in that pour hole thing that I made and not too much but that should just allow it just to stay put 
and stick a bit to the top of the ball. So I mixed up the plaster the same ratio as before, which was 1.75 kilos of water, 2.8 kilos of plaster. Um, that's the mix that works for me. Uh, it, it's important, whatever mix you choose, try, um, make sure you get the same mix for both halves of the mould. You don't want one side more porous, more water, uh, than the other side. Otherwise you're going to, when you cast it, find that when the mould is dry and that water in the plaster has dried out, there's going to be more air in that half of the mould and that's consequently going to draw in more water from the slip, so you're going to have an unbalanced thick one side, thinner the other um, cast clay item. So make sure you get the same consistency on both halves of the mould. So this is mixed and it's just starting to thicken. What I might do is just a little spritz in there just to make sure the plaster has something to chase. Let's just hope that that tube doesn't float. So the plaster's starting to go off. But I've just decided that I want to get this side of the mould a bit thicker because this is the side that has the pore hole in it. So I need the reservoir in that pore hole to be fairly, fairly large because it's quite a large surface area inside the mould compared to this narrow pore hole. So I'm going to want that pore hole fairly deep in order when the slip goes down and the water from the clay absorbs into the plaster there's enough in that pour hole to feed the mould. So I've just mixed up a little bit more, more plaster, same consistency, same ratio, and I'm just going to pour it on top. Just give that a little stir. Fortunately the the, the plastic tube hasn't floated, so that's good. And there's no plaster. Oh, there is. There's a little bit of plaster leaking out. That's because I filled it up higher than my little sides. Than I made the, the side bits. There we go. Hopefully that's averted it. That's been about half an hour. Um, 20 minutes, half an hour. And it's... It is nice and warm and so it's rock solid but look we have lost a bit of plaster down the side there where I had that little emergency where I've overfilled it above my little clay plug. So we've lost a bit of plaster on the outside. Um, it just highlights why you need to uh, make sure that you've blocked up all the exits. It, it doesn't matter because that's on the top of the mould. So let's twist this, see if we can get this out. That's our pore hole. And actually it is about the right height. I needed it to be at least, at least that high above the ball in order to have a decent reservoir of slip when we're casting. Let's get that clay out of that. We can reuse that. That will go back in the bag. Chuck a bit of water in the bag with it to soften the clay for next time. So that's quite hot. I'm just going to, I'm not going to try and separate it just yet. I'm just going to wait for that heat to go and then I'll try separating. Right, let's, let's see if it comes apart. Oh, it does. And there we go.
There we are. That's a two part mould. What I need to do now is just tidy up the edges. I mean for for pouring for yourself. Just a little bit of tidying up the edges there and you're good to go. Uh, if you wanted to be precise as I said you could square it up, sand down the edges on the outside, um, try and disguise the mistake on the top there so no one knows. Um, all I'm going to do just to make it nicer to handle is I'm going to rasp down the edges and also the four hole as I said the um, the plaster has got underneath just a little bit so we've got a bit of a lip on that pour hole so I'll just go around that with a knife I think I'm happy with that. I, I just need to leave that to dry to get that water out and then we can cast it and see if it works. Uh, so I would leave that uh, I would leave that for maybe a week or two to dry out. If you've got a warm environment with circulating air then perhaps within a two to three days you could try casting it. The longer you leave it the better. There's no room for the water from the, the slip to go uh, if the if the plaster is still wet. Okay, that's been left for a couple of weeks and that plaster is really dry now. So I've got myself a bit of stoneware slip. Now that should set pretty quickly because the mould is as dry as it's ever going to be. In fact as I'm talking I can already see that the level of this slip is starting to go down as the water from the slip absorbs into the plaster of the mould. But I, I would guess maybe 10 minutes and then I can tip it and uh, let it set up. Right that level's dropped about enough I think. What we could do to check if we wanted to is we could just cut a little V down into the liquid part of it of the spare and have a look and see how thick it is at the point where the, um, the slips currently still wet and that's probably I don't know three four mil thick which is ideal for, for this piece so we'll tip it out tip out the excess and again now it's uh, another waiting game just wait for that to firm up and that will probably take, well it's really warm today so I should think within an hour I can probably get back into that and take it out and have a look at it. Until then we just need to leave it to dry. That's been about an hour, hour, just over an hour. So this, um, this point is illustrating why I didn't mention this when I was doing it, but why I used a, a knife blade to just smooth the flat surfaces of the mould, which might seem a bit pointless. Um, all you may think that's going to achieve is a nice smooth surface to touch, but it's now, when I'm cleaning the, the spare clay off the surface of the mould, if, if I've got a rucked surface, the clay is going to stick in all the crevices. If I've got a nice flat clean surface, I can just take that clay straight off and if you can take all the clay off the outside then the mould is going to dry quicker between castings. Now I think from the feel of that, that feels like it's a little bit too wet to take out. So let's just ease the mould, see if it's going to come apart. My rule is if the mould isn't 
I'm going to come apart, then leave it. It's not ready. Just don't be impatient. And that, I'm not going to force it because that will tear it. So I'll just leave that for a bit now. Um, get on with something else, come back and check it in a, I don't know, about another hour perhaps. So let's try again. This is uh, an hour later. And I know this is going to work because I can actually see the clay has started to pull away from the mould. Ta-da! The first casting of, of a mould, you might find that it doesn't want to release too quickly because the mould doesn't know what it's supposed to do. You've got to open those pores of the plaster up a bit and when it's a little bit damper you'll find that pieces don't stick so much. On the first casting there was an old rule that I used to live by when I first started casting which was chuck the first pouring away, chuck the first piece away because you waste too much time trying to get it out in one piece. But I'm determined with this one. There's nothing to stick to, there's nothing to stick to. But what happens, um, we didn't use any separator on this piece, but sometimes when you're using separator on the item, that separator goes into the plaster of the mould and then that acts as a barrier between the, the clay and the plaster and doesn't let it release uh, as easily as it should do. I don't want to force this because this would be embarrassing because I'm trying to make a video of me taking, uh, making this mould. So what I'm going to do again, just going to stop filming, leave it for another half hour or so and then then it will come out without me wrecking it. Okay, that's been 20 minutes. Oh, there we go. Ta-da! There we are. There is our cast ball. Uh, it's still leather hard so I'll need to leave that to to dry before I clean it up. What I could do is I could leave it in the mould then it would shrink and uh, it would shrink without grabbing onto anything and it would support it perfectly in a mould like this. Um, or I could stand it on a, a bed of shredded paper to make sure the ball doesn't distort. Um, I might pop it back in there. Now I, now I know that it's come out. I could leave that now for a few hours or I could leave it for a few days. Um, there we are, that's greenware of that initial shape that we made the mould of. Done.